Well, let's go ahead and start. I'd like to introduce our guest speaker today, Teresa Najjar. She's a doctor of physical therapy, uh, DPT, and she's also board certified in uh, a clinical specialist of neurologic physical therapy. And this, these two credentials, but especially the uh, neurologic physical therapy credential is a fantastic credential to have because many physical therapists are specialized in orthopedic issues, for example, but Teresa specializes in neurological issues like Parkinson's disease. And she's taken all of the Parkinson's disease exercise and for fitness related training courses and actually teaches fitness training to other Parkinson's uh, exercise uh, teachers. And so she is well, she's really an expert on physical therapy, fitness, exercise, and Parkinson's disease. So we're so glad to have her here today. And she's going to be giving a short talk about some, some concepts in exercise for PD and then do um, some demonstration of some exercises herself. So thanks. Take it away, Teresa. Thank you, Robin. Thank you for the introduction. It's really great to be here with everybody today. Again, my name is Teresa, and I've been um, I've been helping people with Parkinson's for over a decade. Um, can reach their their wellness goals, um, and through that process, and through just through learning from you guys and learning from the literature, um, and and uh, colleagues, etc. Um, I've I'd like to present to you today something I'm uh, tentatively calling the Fab Four Fitness Framework <laughs> for people with Parkinson's. And so essentially uh, what I'd like to talk to you about today and then maybe give you a little sample of are four uh, different buckets that you can think about when you think about exercising while living with Parkinson's disease. And so as you can see on the screen, Robin pulled up the four buckets for you. And we'll also be, um, you'll also have access to um, this uh, PDF that you can download and take a look at. And so when you have Parkinson's disease, there are really uh, four key areas to focus on when you're thinking about um, getting exercise. The first being cardiovascular exercise. That's exercise that targets the heart. The second being strength training. The third being flexibility training. And the fourth category being balance and agility training. And so we're going to take each category, uh, each one category by category. I'm going to tell you a little bit about that, um, each category, and then um, give you some ideas of what exercises might fall in those groups. And then after that, um, I'll pause for some questions and discussion. And then if there's time, uh, we'll be doing a little bit of a demo um, so that you can get an, a little taste of what each of the four uh, buckets, some exercises that might fit in each of the four different buckets. So with that, I will just start with the top circle, cardiovascular. So when you think about cardiovascular training, examples would be exercises that get your heart pumping. So this might be going for a brisk walk. This might be pole walking. This might be a boxing class. This might be running. This might be doing rowing machine or, or a treadmill or high intensity interval training. There's a lot of different ways to get the heart rate up. And what we're looking for here uh, for something to be considered kind of cardiovascular exercises, we're looking for exercise that happens at a certain intensity. And so there are a couple ways to measure intensity with cardiovascular exercise. One is to look at your heart rate, to actually measure your heart rate with a, with a Fit, Fitbit or Apple Watch or any, something like that, or with a chest strap, actually measuring your heart rate and trying to work within a cardiovascular fitness zone. Another way, kind of easier way, is to think about intensity or how hard you're working on a one to 10 scale. So Roman, would you mind just flipping to the second page for me where we can just pull up this intensity scale? 
and you'll have access to this. But um, this, this scale here um, is based on the rate of perceived exertion scales. So this is an evidence-based scale that you can use to identify or help you identify how hard you're working during any given exercise. And so um, we're going to focus a little more on the, me the middle part of the scale here where you can see the green colors. Okay. When you're doing, when you're targeting the cardiovascular bucket, you're looking for exercises that fall somewhere between a five to an eight on the scale. Now, if you're very new to exercise, if maybe you haven't exercised in a really long time, you may wanna start with targeting a four, which we call light, moderate intensity. So a four is where you're sweating maybe a little bit, um, maybe you can, you can definitely hold a conversation with others. So you're not breathing that hard, but you're, wor you're working a little bit. So if you're new to exercise, maybe targeting a four. If you want to kick it up a notch, the next uh, uh, bracket would be moderate intensity exercise. And so on this scale, um, you'd be looking to target a five or a six. So asking when you're working out and you're asking yourself the question, how hard am I working? A five or six means that you're working pretty hard. You're starting to get a little bit breathless and maybe you're, you're um, sweating a little bit. If you wanna take your cardiovascular exercise to a vigorous level, which would be a seven or eight out of 10 on this scale, then you would be working hard enough that it would be pretty hard to talk. If I was to ask you a question while you were doing a vigorous intensity exercise, you'd probably be able to grunt at me a little bit, maybe a little nodding, but we wouldn't be able to answer me in full sentences because you're working that hard. So when we're thinking about that cardiovascular bucket, we're looking for exercises that generally fall or intensity of exercise that generally falls between the five to the eight on this scale. And Robin, could you flip back to the first page for me? Thank you. So what I've done on this, um, this little bubble for the cardiovascular is I've mentioned um, the two different levels. If you're, if you, if when you're working out, you prefer to target the moderate level, that five to six out of ten for your cardiovascular exercise for the week. You're looking to target at least 150 minutes of moderate intensity. That's five 30-minute moderate intensity workouts a week. If you're gearing towards the vigorous, the seven to eight out of ten, we're looking for at least 75 minutes a week of cardiovascular exercise at the vigorous intensity. So that just gives you a benchmark of what, if the, all the stars aligned, if it was a perfect world, that's what you would be looking to achieve. And so when you go and you're reflecting later on after this, this um, talk and thinking about what exercises you're doing, asking yourself, is there a way that I could work toward that benchmark? How, what can I add? to my workout that might help me towards that benchmark, or am I already there? So that's the cardiovascular bucket. And now we're gonna talk about the strength bucket. Um, so thinking, of, oh, I will say, actually, let me back up. So a plug for intensity. <laughs> I did wanna talk about, so why, why is intensity important? Why is cardiovascular fitness important for people with Parkinson's specifically? So what we know now from the literature is that high intensity exercise has what we call neuroprotective and neurorestorative properties. So neuroprotective means that in people with Parkinson's, high intensity exercise can actually in, well, inhibit primary <laughs> neurodegeneration. It can, it can slow down the process of Parkinson's disease, high intensity exercise. And the second piece is that high intensity exercise can actually boost restorative properties in the brain to help generate new growth in the brain. So the interesting thing about intense exercise of cardiovascular, intense cardiovascular exercise is that in the brain of someone with Parkinson's, when you do intense exercise, it allows your brain to release more of its available dopamine. 
So it does not cause more dopamine to be produced. It, exercise doesn't do that. It doesn't make more dopamine be produced in the brain, but it helps you better use the dopamine you have because more dopamine gets released and the receptors that hold on to dopamine, more of them form. So exercise is pretty interesting, especially the cardiovascular piece in how it actually impacts the brains of people with Parkinson's like yourself. So that's why I put this bucket at the top. And that's why we're saying, we actually want a lot of this. We want at least 150 minutes per week of moderate or 75 minutes per week of vigorous because it really does impact your brain. So moving on to the second bucket of strength, when we think of strength, there's a lot of things you can do. You can lift heavy objects. <laughs> you can use weight machines in the gym. You can use elastic bands. You can do body weight training. There are a lot of ways that you can strengthen your muscles. And when we think about strength training in Parkinson's, we wanna pay special attention to strengthening the back of the body. So it doesn't mean that we forget about the front of the body. It doesn't mean I'm, it doesn't mean that if someone wants to work on strengthening their bicep, which is on the front of the body, I'm not going to say, oh no, you have Parkinson's, you can't strengthen your bicep. What I will say is, yes, let's strengthen that bicep. And then let's also strengthen the back of the body as well. We want to strengthen the back of the body specifically in Parkinson's because it helps with that upright posture. It helps with walking. It helps with balance. And so we really want to target some key muscles of the back of the body, like our glutes, like our hamstrings, like our calves. And so when you're uh, at home doing strength training or maybe at the gym doing strength training, those are some great areas to really target is the back of the body. So I'll, um, and there are lots and lots of ways to do that. We'll try a couple exercises today um, that target some of the back of the body. So I'll give you three examples today um, during our demo portion. Um, but, but yeah, so focusing on um, the back of the body strengthening is really important when you have Parkinson's disease. Hey, Teresa, the, mm -hmm. it's precise, Robin. When you say the back of the body, do you primarily mean the trunk, the torso, or- I mean, body. any muscle that's situated on the back of your body. Okay, all right. Yeah, so it could be the neck, back of the neck, back of the trunk. So your shoulder uh, blade, your shoulder girdle, um, your back muscles that are kind of uh, along your spine, your butt muscles, your the back of your uh, thighs, the back of your calf, the, your calf area. So any muscles on the back of the body from heel to toe, you want to try and uh, focus on. And again, it doesn't mean you don't strengthen the front of the body too. It doesn't mean you have to avoid strengthening the front of the body, but you want to prioritize strengthening any muscles that are literally in the back of your body. Okay, thanks. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> Um, it was a great question. Thank you for, thank you for um, helping me clarify. Um, so when we think about the third bucket, flexibility bucket, we're thinking about stretching. Examples might be doing formal stretching routine. Yoga is a great example of, of ways to target flexibility. Um, and so when you're thinking about flexibility training, you're actually thinking about stretching daily if possible, even if it's just for 10 minutes a day for a short period of day, really thinking about trying to stretch daily. And when you're stretching, trying to hold that stretch for at least 50 seconds, 15 seconds, at least 15 seconds, preferably 30 seconds to a minute, but at least 15 seconds for stretching. And so some key muscles to think about stretching, and we'll practice stretching these today. Some key muscles to think about stretching would be your calves. Calves can get pretty tight. Um, another muscle to think about stretching would be your hamstrings, which are the back of the thigh. And so I'll teach you a calf stretch today, a hamstring stretch. Another great area to stretch is your trunk, especially trunk rotation. So we'll practice a stretch that targets that today. 
Some other areas to stretch might be the front of the hip um, or and the quad and the glutes. So um, a lot of your big muscle groups you're going to want to try and stretch. And so we'll practice three um, stretches today. We'll practice the calf stretch, we'll practice a hamstring stretch, and we'll practice a trunk rotation stretch. Um, and then the fourth bucket uh, is what I'm calling balance and agility. And they kind of go together, um, but they can be diff they can also be done at diff very different intensities. Um, so when you think about balance and agility, examples might be Tai Chi. And so we'll practice a couple um, uh, Tai Chi activities today. Um, dance is actually a really great way to work on both balance and agility. There's some really great research on tango and people with Parkinson's disease, for example. Yoga is another great way to work on balance and agility. So is boxing, um, doing ladder drills and circuit training can be great ways to work on balance or um, great ways to work on your balance and agility bucket. And so for this bucket, we're looking at trying to target a couple times a week some activities that maybe touch on the balance and agility area. And so what you'll notice when you look at the examples on this on the sheet, you'll notice that there's some overlap, right? So for example, boxing appears in a couple different places, yoga appears in a couple different places. And so what this means is that you don't have to designate each bubble as completely separate. It's possible to double dip. So for example, if you're taking a class like a rock steady boxing class, a rock steady boxing class often targets the cardiovascular bucket, the strength bucket, the flexibility bucket, and the agility bucket. If you take my Monday class, which is a high intensity interval training class, we definitely target the cardiovascular uh, bucket, but we also target agility and balance and we target strength. So there are lots of ways to sort of double dip and target different buckets all in one go. Um, and one of the best ways to do that is by taking a group fitness class designed for people with Parkinson's because they'll often have these different elements interwoven in. So you won't have to, to think about, okay, did I get my cardio? Did I get my strength? Did I get my flexibility? Did I get, did I get my balance this week? You can just say, ah, I went to rock steady boxing and I got all of them this week. So with that, I'm going to pause because I kind of dumped a lot of information on you guys all at once. And so we will be trying out each of these different activities, but I just want to pause and take some questions, clear up any um, areas that I may have caused accidental confusion on. So I'll just pause here um, and uh, open it up for, for some questions about the Fab Four Fitness uh, framework. Um, yeah, I'll just pause there. Okay, and again, this is Robin, and you can either use the chat function or the Q&A function to type in any questions if you had any. And I, I had one, uh, one more question, Teresa. Is one of these buckets, one of these four buckets, any more important than the other? Um, that's a good question, and the answer is they're all important. Um, they're all important. Um, Parkinson's impacts, you guys know, Parkinson's impacts many aspects of our lives. And so, and because of that, we want to make sure that we're supporting all those different aspects through activity. And so we want to make sure we're taking care of our heart health as well as our brain health through cardiovascular exercise. We wanna make sure we're staying nice and strong and flexible so that we can do everyday activities and get up off the couch and sit down on the toilet and get up from the toilet and those sorts of things. And we wanna make sure that we're, we're um, optimizing our balance and our ability to move around so that we can go to the restaurant with our family and navigate uh, in a low lit restaurant around chairs and things, especially now that we can go back, right? So, so I guess I would say there's no easy answer to that question. The answer is all of them are important. Okay, and uh, I see Marlene has raised her hand and Marlene, I will click on allow to talk. So I think you um, should be able to speak at some point. You could speak your question. You might have to unmute yourself. 
it looks like uh, you need to unmute yourself. I don't think I can do it at my end. Or you could type in your question, Marlene. If, if, oh, there, it looks like you've unmuted yourself. Go ahead. Um, it was an error. Sorry. Oh, okay, all right. I thought thanks. I was unmuted, sorry. Okay, thanks for letting us know. Um, any other questions from people? Oh, okay. Um, um, all right. Uh, some uh, one of our attendees says, "I notice that I tend to stutter more. Does exercise help with stuttering?" Thank you, Fred. That's a great question. So, you bring up something really interesting, which is that with right now, I'm kind of talking about whole body exercise. However, your mouth is full of a whole bunch of muscles. Your, your, your vo voice um, is full of a whole bunch of muscles. And so there are actually ways to strengthen speech. Um, and there are people who specialize in both helping you strengthen your muscles of speech and swallow, as well as focusing on how to help you communicate clearly, whether that be addressing a stutter or maybe word finding or things like that. And those people are called speech therapists. So I'm a physical therapist. And so there are speech therapists who actually specialize in strengthening um, the mouth and the throat. Um, and so if you're looking to um, help or address a stutter, that might be a person to reach out to, might be a speech therapist um, in, your, in your local community. I'm not sure where, where you live. If you live in, um, here in the Bay Area in Palo Alto, there are quite a few um, speech therapists who are trained in something called LSVT Loud. And that's just one of many uh, training programs out there of, uh, dedicated to speech and Parkinson's disease. So that might be um, a, an avenue to take a look at. Um, in regards to the research on cardiovascular, general cardiovascular strength, flexibility or balance and agility training and speech, I haven't really looked into that. It doesn't mean there isn't literature out there. I don't know that realm of literature. And so I'm, I'm telling you this right now, Fred, I am intrigued. And actually after a class today, I'm gonna go look it up and see what see what comes up on a, on a literature search. <laughs> okay, well, let us know. If I will, I will. So thank you, Fred, for your question. And, and I do think that a speech therapist would be a good, um, a good person to reach out to. Uh, and kind of related to uh, the question, what uh, relationship is there, Teresa, if any, between exercise, physical exercise, and cognition or mental functioning, mental acuity, um, dementia prevention, all those kinds of things? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, exercise, um, especially the cardiovascular bucket, um, literally changes the brain. It, it, it um, increases blood flow to the brain. It causes the nerves in the brain to sprout and make more connections. Um, there's even some evidence that it um, activates genes important for growth of, of um, for neuroplasticity or change in the brain and repair and cell balance. Um, and so exercise in general for anybody, regardless of whether you have Parkinson's or not, actually can really help the, uh, I guess I'll call it the biome, the environment um, that our brain cells live in and really support growth and connections and functioning. I'm not sure, did I answer your question, Robin? Yeah, I, 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 you did. Thank you very much. Yeah, so it seems to, that there's a lot of connections there between between uh, cognition and <clears throat> excuse me, cognition and exercise. Yes, and if you're interested, if you're a person who's maybe interested in an in exercise um, specifically related to uh, training the brain. Physical therapists can help you there. Occupational therapists can help you there. And actually, there's a really interesting course 
um, and I'm not, I'm not being paid to say this or anything, by the way, but there's a, a course that um, one of that someone I know has uh, created for fitness trainers um, or exercise professionals called the brain trainer course. And it's actually geared specifically towards helping uh, fitness coaches and personal trainers train their clients like you and train their brain at the same time. So if, if that's something you're interested in, or maybe you're working with a, an exercise professional who's interested, that's a good, uh, so I'll just put a plug in there for the brain trainer course. It's actually a really good um, uh, course that teaches people how to integrate uh, exercise and brain training. Okay, and uh, another question came in, Teresa, mm -hmm. which is, uh, when you're doing your exercise class, and, and I'll, I'll tell everyone here, as they probably saw in the email, Teresa teaches three Parkinson-specific exercise classes each week. And uh, one of them is uh, free uh, through uh, Redwood City Senior Center Adaptive Physical Therapy Program or Physical Education Program. And the other two are available at a small charge through, um, well, and they're all available through Teresa's website, synapticpt.com. And uh, as part of your, the question is, as part of your uh, exercise classes, Teresa, do you have people speak out loud and use their voice so as to exercise their voices as well as yes. the body? Yes, thank you. That's a really great question. Yes, yeah, so during my, uh, my fitness classes that I teach, I do encourage people to count out loud um, so that we're actually working the, the voice as well as the other parts of the body. Um, and I try and encourage people when they count out loud to speak loudly, but to not shout it out. We don't want to strain the voice, just like we could strain a muscle if we push it too hard. We don't want to strain the voice, but we do want to use the voice. And so I encourage people to count. We'll count. Sometimes we'll count up from one to 10. Sometimes we'll count back from 10 to one uh, or 20 to one, <laughs> depending on how, how many reps I'm making people do that day. Um, and the other thing is I'll encourage people to kind of say, uh, say things with me. So when we're doing activities or exercises, I'll often count, or maybe I'll say, you know, lift, step, back, down, lift, step, back, down. And I invite people to say those things with me to practice not just the speech, but also the remembering of what, what is it that I'm saying and what is it that I'm doing. So I do definitely incorporate that within the fitness classes that I teach. Okay, sounds good. You want to continue on then, Teresa? Yeah, absolutely. If there aren't any other questions, um, I guess there's one thing I wanted to mention real quick too in the handouts that I just thought of. Um, Rob, would you mind flipping to the very last page? Sure. So I just, um, so on this um, handout that you guys will get, there are some opportunities for you to sort of write in um, your plan or maybe what you're already doing in each of the different four buckets. But I also put this on here. I've, I've created this little 30-day um, step tracker. And so especially for those of you who maybe are just getting back into exercise or maybe haven't exercised in a really long time and want to start, one way to start might be to get a pedometer of some sort, get a, get a step counter and just for, for, a third, for a week, for seven days, just track how many steps am I taking? So for seven days tracking on this calendar, how many steps am I taking a day? And then after you've done that for seven days, take an average and say, okay, my average is, I'm just gonna pick a number, a thousand steps a day. My average is a thousand steps a day that I'm taking per week. And so then you can set a goal for yourself, whatever you think would be reasonable. So maybe week one, I was to had an average of a thousand steps a day. So week two, I'm gonna try and shoot for 1,200 steps a day. So I gave you this um, for those of you who maybe are just trying to get back into fitness or maybe those who, are, who already have a tracker of some sort and, and wanna use it. This might be a way to take a look and see how active you are being during the, uh, the week. And then um, if it feels okay, setting a, a goal for yourself that you know is achievable 
um, that you can maybe increase that level a little bit of how many steps you take a week. So that's one way to kind of dip your toe into the water of increasing your overall endurance level um, for participating in exercise. Any questions on that? I'll pause there real quick and then we'll get to a demo. Uh, it looks like, Teresa, somebody's asked how many steps a day would be an appropriate goal for somebody with Parkinson's disease? Yeah, that's a good question. And so, so I will say that the 10,000, you know, you've probably heard 10,000 steps a day. There is some evidence to indicate that 10,000 steps is, uh, we do, you know, we're not really sure where that number came from initially. Um, and so what I would say is, regardless of whether you have Parkinson's, you don't have Parkinson's, doesn't matter. You start where you are and then you build up from there. So that's why I want you to measure for that first week to see where, where are you? How many steps are you actually taking? And then add maybe 10%, maybe 10% to that um, until you work your way up to an area that feels comfortable. Um, I guess I would say if I had to give a number, I would say at least, I would say th that your target might be working up to 5,000 steps plus. But there are some of you that may start measuring and may say, wow, I'm, I'm getting 800 steps a day and 5,000 may see, seem very daunting. So I don't wanna give a number that will discourage you from moving. And so what I would actually encourage you to do is find your number. It's not a competition. So finding your number, whatever that may be, and then adding 10, see if you can add 10% to that, just starting with a 10% increase in number of steps. Okay, great. We got uh, two more questions oh. came in. Okay. One, one, a person asks, is group exercise better than one-on-one? -on -one? Maybe you could discuss the pros and cons. Sure. So, um, so yeah, so there are pros and cons to, to both. My um, instinctual answer to that question is any exercise that you enjoy and that you do, whether it's one-on-one -on -one or group, is the one you should be doing. So, so if you find that you thrive in a group environment, do group. If you find that a group environment is too distracting, you need one-on-one, -on -one, do one-on-one. -on -one. Um, so it's really up to you as an individual and knowing yourself and what really motivates you and encourages you to work out. So pros and cons with group, you have the social aspect that can be very motivating for some people. It can be very engaging to uh, interact with your, your peers, whether virtually or in person. Um, sometimes there can be a little, you can kind of be inspired by what, how some other people are moving. On the flip side, sometimes it can be distracting being in a group environment, or sometimes you might feel intimidated being in a group environment. In one-on-one, -on -one, it's kind of the opposite. Sometimes you may want that social engagement and you're not going to get that necessarily in in one on one so so it's pros and cons to either way and so what i would say is um you do you find find the one that you like the best and do that okay great uh, another question um perhaps a technical question came in somebody says what are the heart rate buckets of exertion 220 minus your age times 80% seems too simplistic. Ah, uh, yeah. So you're you're. So this person is asking uh, that what he said with the 220, or he or she. Um, this person said is um, they're referring to something called the Carvonin formula. And so the Carvonin formula, and you can you can Google it, is a formula where you can calculate kind of your heart rate zones for during your workout. What I would say with the heart rate zones, and part of the reason why I didn't uh, get into that too much today is because sometimes medications can impact our heart rate zones. Sometimes people have um, conditions that uh, besides Parkinson's that impact their heart in some way. And so if you are looking for the heart rate zone prescription for you as an individual for working out, I would recommend that that's something that you ask your doctor about 
or if you're working with a physical therapist or an exercise professional, ask them to do the calculation for you. There is the very general um, Carvonin formula calculation, but again, if you if you are someone who does have um, any heart conditions or are on any medication that may impact your blood pressure or your heart rate, those formulas may not be an accurate way to um, measure how hard you're working. And But the one to 10 scale will work quite well for those folks who maybe the heart rate isn't gonna be the best indicator of how hard you're working during exercise. Okay, I think. So you, that's it for our questions for right now. Okay, great. So what we'll do next is we're gonna, so we're gonna move into an exercise demo where we're gonna do a little bit of a warm up, and then we're gonna just touch on the four buckets. I'll give, I have, I think two or three exercises in each category we'll try. Um, what I do wanna say before we do this is that um, I have three, I have kind of three rules. And also you don't have to participate at all. You're more than welcome to, to watch and not participate. If you do choose to participate, rule one is safety first. I'm not there with you and I don't know your personal health scenario and your mobility needs. And so safety is always paramount when you try any new exercise. And so I did wanna just say that by doing these exercises, if you do choose to participate, you acknowledge that you're exercising at your own risk today. Um, the second thing is to um, what I call choose your own adventure. I'm going to show a couple different versions of some of these exercises. Most will actually be in sitting, but there will always be a seated option. So you choose whichever way you think you can do the exercise safest and whichever way your body is telling you it needs to be done today. And the third thing is have fun. Just go with it. Try it out if you want. Um, I may show things you like, I may show things you don't like, that's okay. I just wanted to give you a little sprinkling of what some activities in the different buckets might be. So again, safety first, and just know that if, if you do these exercises, you're participating at your own risk. Any questions about that? Before I and as a reminder, I do teach three fitness classes a week for people with Parkinson's. And I also record each of the classes and have a little service on Patreon where you can subscribe to uh, those, those recordings if you'd like. All the information is on my website, synapticpt.com. And with that, I'll open it up for comments, questions about how the exercise went or any lingering questions about the earlier material. Uh, Teresa, I wanted to uh, first off thank you for for uh, the great talk and and a nice demonstration. And uh, we're we're back to recording again since we're not doing the exercise component. And I uh, we've a few more questions have come in. And one thing I wanted to point out was uh, that Teresa did um, some PWR power. Parkinson's Wellness Recovery is the acronym or the um, what the PWR acronym stands for. She did some boxing. We could call that perhaps rock steady boxing. Uh, she did some Tai Chi and she did some stretching. So uh, the wonderful thing about Teresa is that she employs a variety of uh, exercise modalities or exercise forms, and she's an expert um, on on a lot of these uh, program exercise programs. So that's a great thing. So, and as as Teresa said early on, the the best is to do the exercise that you enjoy because that's the exercise that you'll keep doing. And so, hopefully, you can find something among here. For, between the PWR, between the Tai Chi, the boxing and the stretching that, that's good for everybody. Um, uh, can and you, you have some great resources yeah. on your website. Um, so if you guys haven't taken a look at the Stanford website, they you guys list the fitness classes that happen throughout Northern California. I only have a tiny little smattering of offering compared to all of it. So yeah, so just like you were saying, Robin, it, if we were doing something today and you thought, you know, I really like that, or you did some Tai Chi and thought, I really like that. There are, um, there are some teachers who teach both through Stanford and in the South Bay uh, who just do Tai Chi. There are Tango for Parkinson's classes. There's rock steady boxing classes, power moves, 
classes. So if we did something today and you thought, aha, that's something I like and you're gravitating towards that, check out the Stanford website to find classes near you that really target that area that you sort of fell in love with today. And is the uh, class or the sort of demo that you gave today, is that kind of representative of, of your other classes, Teresa? Do you do a <laughs> That's little That's a good question. Um, I would say it depends on the class. It depends on the class. So I can tell you about each of the classes. So the Thursday class, which is a free class, that is a power moves based class specifically. So in that class, we do all the, the basically we do kind of the, the foundational power moves program. So we do exercises in on the back, on the stomach, on hands and knees, in sitting and in standing. And that the Thursday class is pretty consistent every week. Um, we do lots of the same activities because they kind of are our building blocks of movement. So the Thursday class is power moves based. My Monday class is much more of a target for the cardiovascular bucket. And so that one, um, we do have, we do do some boxing in that class. Usually every week we have a few boxing elements, but we also have a bit of a smorgasbord. I, I kind of wake up Monday morning and decide what we're going to do. <laughs> so it depends. We'll do, oh, we'll do, um, some, uh, boxing. We'll do some, um, sometimes we'll use weights, but we do activities that really get the heart rate up. On Monday and on Tuesday is a bit more of a smorgasbord, a little bit more like what we did today, except for the Tai Chi. I don't usually incorporate the Tai Chi into Tuesday's class, but we'll do some power moves. We might throw in some strength training. Um, we'll definitely end with some a little bit of flexibility. All my classes end with a little bit of flexibility. So um, depends on the day, I guess, is the long winded answer. And if anyone has any questions about what's offered in the classes, feel free to send me an email or check out my website and, and um, see what's, what happens on, on which day. <laughs> Sounds good. And um, we had a couple of uh, questions come in. Uh, one lady asked, when I use my arm and lift weights, a lot of the times I tremor. Could you say something? Is that common? Yeah, that can be common. So um, I have heard anecdotally, and I've even seen um, that sometimes temporarily after exercise or during exercise, a person's tremor can increase. Um, exercise is still really important to be doing. And so if, if, this, if um, for the person who asked the question or anyone who maybe is, it feels like they're in a similar situation where they're experiencing some tremoring during um, the exercises that you're doing, um, one thing you might want to do is you may want to reach out to a physical therapist um, or, or, if, or a personal trainer um, to just have them look at you doing this, the fitness exercise and to see if there's anything that might need to be tweaked or modified about the form of the exercise. If it's, if you're, if you have some concerns about the tremor specifically, you, you may want to reach out to a PT and get an assessment and just get their take on it. Um, but overall, if it's not painful, if you're not hearing, um, joints making weird noises when you're doing it. If it's not painful and it's it's um, sounding okay and you're moving with good form, then I would say, generally speaking, it's still okay to do those exercises. But I would check in with a one-on-one -on -one session with a professional just to make sure. Okay, and that brings up another question. In the virtual group classes that you offer, for example, those three classes uh, during the week, how much um, instruction or tips can you give to an individual person? How you know, for example, if yeah. if the person who has a tremor associated with the use of the weights, how much uh, uh, analysis could you give of of that or people's form during the class? Yeah, so, so it depends on the class. I would say for the Thursday class, we have a lot of people who come. It's, um, and so I can't give individual tips for the Thursday class, but I do try and provide a lot of additional verbal instructions on form and technique as we go through the Thursday class. For the Monday and Tuesday classes, which are a little higher level, um, what I recommend is that if people who are taking the class do have questions about their form or concerns, they can call me and we can set up just a, a quick chat on the phone or a quick video 
um, no charge, just to talk about what is what is were you experiencing during the class? Just a quick 15 minute, you know, um, call or something. And then based on how that conversation goes, they may just, you know, we may talk together and decide mm, maybe you do need to be seen one on one by a physical therapist for whatever you're experiencing. And I can do that or another PT can do that. Or maybe you do need to work one on one with a fitness coach or maybe you hear some tips on um, some fitness and wellness tips, give them a try and let me know how it goes. So it just depends on what the person is experiencing in the class. Um, but I do try and um, have an open invitation that whoever comes to the class, especially the Monday and Tuesday classes where it's a little bit smaller, um, it's a little easier for me to also see people on the screen while they're working out and then at, and then give some live gear my feedback a little bit towards what I'm seeing, not to the individual, but kind of some general, if I'm generally seeing people are up here hiking their shoulders or bent over, you'll often hear me say, let's open up our chat, you know, so, so I definitely can see people during the class. Um, so but I mean, picking on any individual. Exactly. I don't want people to feel like they're being picked on, but Very if you can come to my class and have an individual concern, you can call me or email me and we can very nice. About it. Can you say what the charge is? I believe you do, yeah, don't you have like packages. Yeah. So for for the fitness classes that I teach, um, the Thursday class is free. Um, we do ask if you come to the Thursday class, since I do that in collaboration with the Redwood City Adaptive Phys Ed Department, there is a, a little bit of paperwork to fill out for them um, for that class. But it, that is free um, for my Monday and Tuesday fitness classes. I only charge $10.99 a class. Um, and you can sign up, you, they're kind of, you can drop in or you can sign up for a bunch at once. Um, if you go to my website, um, you'll see the information about the classes and, and even the link to sign up. But they're only they're only $10.99. And then I have the, I do have the the recordings. I do record the live classes. And um, those I kind of just upload every week or maybe every few weeks, I upload a, a bunch of them. Um, and that's $25 a month for that kind of on-demand extra. If the class, if my class times don't work out for you, but you do want to work out with me, that's another way where you can sort of do some of the workouts um, on your own time. Great. And somebody asked if Medicare uh, covers the cost and, and unfortunately, no, Medicare doesn't cover any, any kind of exercise uh, class. Um, Let's see, we had another question uh, about weight. So if you don't have, uh, like so many of us during the pandemic, don't have any weights, what are some options that people could use if they don't have weights? Yeah, so if you do want to do an exercise and add a little bit of weight to it, but you don't have formal hand weights, um, one of the easiest things to do is to take a water bottle and fill it, fill it with water um not maybe not all the way maybe it's partly with water um but you can use that as a form of resistance another thing actually that i've even used uh, before because at the beginning of pandemic believe it or not i didn't have hand weights because i uh wasn't prepared <laughs> so it took me actually about well some of you know because you probably went through it too it took a couple months to actually for the hand weights to come back into stock um soup cans were kind of my go-to <laughs> <laughs> so you can use uh, soup cans, uh, depending or any jarred good, really, and depending on the size or the weight, it'll you know change your workout. So those are just two kind of options off the top of my head. If you don't have um, formal hand weights, to try water bottles or or um, soup cans. I just wouldn't do, I wouldn't do like um, anything fizzy. <laughs> So don't so don't uh, don't be using your your coke cans. <laughs> uh, one thing I started doing um, because I I didn't have any weights at the beginning of the pandemic was I took those gallon size milk jugs and of course once I finished the milk uh, then I could fill them up with uh, water and I you you can adjust the height so you can kind of get um, different weights in a sense. Uh, different varieties so that yeah, works a gallon's out. heavy <laughs> yeah, a gallon I think a heavy. gallon it's is like six, 16 <laughs> pounds yes indeed. so I, I didn't often fill them up but that was nice because there's a nice handle on it yeah and it's a smaller handle whereas the cans were kind of big for my hand to grip but a little milk jug handle was was easier for me to deal with so that's what I ended up using that's um, a great suggestion Robin 
Yeah, we had a question came in that's uh, come in that says, uh, my biggest challenges are the shuffling, tremors, freezing, et cetera. I'm aware that exercise, et cetera, cannot hurt, but has exercise been proven to improve, proven to uh, improve the situation? That's a great question. So um, there are a couple of things to think about. So today I'm talking more about the fitness realm of things, which is the, the fitness buckets I talked about, cardio and strength and flexibility and balance. If your biggest concern is a little more in the line of shuffling, of freezing, of tremor, of maybe a fall risk, there are definitely exercises that can help. And those exercises would be best prescribed by a physical therapist. So the answer is yes, there are exercises that can help. And for those of you who feel like maybe there's some freezing getting in the way or some of the shuffling, that's when I would reach out to your physical therapist for some one-on-one -on -one exercise prescription to target those specific needs. And then once you've worked on those pieces, then um, working on the bigger picture wellness piece. But it sounds like in that case, what I would recommend is actually being seen by a physical therapist to get an individualized program to target those specific um, uh, concerns. Okay, very good. And uh, um, you can, attendees can both ask Teresa for referrals to physical therapists and also us at Stanford, um, you can email me at rriddle at stanford.edu. We keep a large list of PTs that we refer people to. And again, we would always try to refer someone to people like Teresa who are NCS, neurologic clinical specialists, and also people who like Teresa have taken the power training class and perhaps LSVT big and, and some of the others. So um, we there are a lot of good resources in the Bay Area and uh, people are starting to open up so you can uh, have in-person uh, PT now. And, and I think in most healthcare settings, they would still ask everyone to wear masks and they- Yeah, I believe PT that we are, yeah. Yeah. So you'll still be wearing a mask when you go into any healthcare yeah, facility indeed. right now. Indeed. Yeah. Um, okay. I don't see any other questions and we're almost out of time anyway. So thanks everyone for joining us. And thank you, especially to Teresa. It was a great workout. I, I did it myself and I, <laughs> I'm sure I'll feel a little bit of it tomorrow, especially in those calves, which don't get very much a uh, workout there. We so. forget about our calves, don't we? we? Do. They do a lot of work for us during the day. They hold us we, up all day. And so I we need know. to give them a little TLC. <laughs> I know. I'm going to definitely focus on those back body exercises now that I know how important they are to, to all of us, not just people with PD, but to, yeah. to all of us as we sit and stand uh, every day and try to have good posture. So uh, thanks again, Teresa and everybody, and we'll see you next time. I'm sorry, I, I don't know who our, let me see if I have written down who our speaker is in August. Um, oh, I, um, we have a speaker. I'm not sure that she's confirmed yet, but uh, we'll, we'll let everybody know uh, next month sometime and see you next time. Thanks so much. And Thank a, recording, a recording along with uh, Teresa's nice uh, handouts will be posted on our website uh, soon. Thanks so much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye, Teresa. Bye.